Jane, thank you so much for making some time. And I know it's a hectic postseason in the NFL, but I appreciate you spending some time. And I really am excited to see the Earning It docuseries. You're the executive producer. So tell me, how important was it for you to highlight there's incredible work that's being done by so many trailblazing women in the NFL? Yeah, it's, it is amazing. I mean, Rob, think about it. If I told you five or six years ago, like, oh, the 2021 Super Bowl, we'd be seeing a female official, Sarah Thomas, on the field, and then not one but two female coaches on the Super Bowl winning team on the Buccaneers, Lori Locus and Moral Java Defar. I mean, you, you, I don't think you would have believed it. I certainly wouldn't have believed it. The pace of change uh, with bringing, you know, kind of smart football minds who I say happen to be female into the game um, has been really, really rapid. So for me, I'm a former uh, reporter and I just felt like somebody needed to get this down and chronicle this um, because it's such a great story for the NFL. It's so different, right? To think about um, women in such a wildly male dominated industry. But also I feel like if you're in a different industry, uh, you might look at it and say, I would like to make some change and bring more diverse voices, a broader range of voice into our um, company or our team or whatever it might be. How do, how do you do that? Um, and I think it's really interesting. We talk not just to the women, but to a ton of men, um, head coaches and players, a commissioner, um, about how this has happened. And you know, none of it's easy. There's no expectation that this is all perfect or it's going to be perfect going forward. But I think it's just a cool story about how something you really would have thought couldn't happen actually is happening um, with a lot of success. So uh, it's been a total labor of love for me, total passion project. Um, it got pushed back. We were supposed to do it. And then the pandemic happened. And I actually think in a funny way, that was really a blessing because then it allowed us to shoot the Super Bowl with Sarah and Lo and MJ. Um, and this season, there have been so many more women uh, involved in so many different levels on and off the field. And so the stories are just better and deeper, and there are more of them. So we have five episodes full. You're going to meet a lot, like 20 plus women in very wow. different roles. So wow. that's an excellent point you make about the NFL it's kind of setting an example for other industries. I hadn't thought about it that way. But now, as you say that, I go, yeah, that's that's for sure something that I can see happening. When you look at these women like Sarah Thomas and Jennifer King and, and Lori Locus, how are you seeing them opening doors for others to follow their path? So it's not something that's isolated or they did it, but I can't. Yeah, well, it's funny. Um, I think they don't even know. We will never be able to, to quantify like the impact that they're really having just by people seeing them. I know it's kind of become a cliche these days, that phrase, like, if you can see it, you can be it. But it's there's such truth to that. I, I think about being when I was a little girl in Soldier Field, um, you know, if I had seen women in all these different positions, would I potentially I was such a football freak, would I have maybe chosen a different career path? I certainly might have. Um, in in the series, it's really fun. There is a an elementary school in Tampa Bay, and the teacher is female, and she decided to basically kind of adopt Low Locust and Bruce Arians as like their classroom mascots. And <laughs> Uh, so Lo has actually done like a Zoom call with them because they kept posting, the teacher kept posting on Twitter, like our boys and girls, uh, girls and boys, I should say in this classroom, you know, they will dress up on game day, on season opening. But what, what she's done is part of the curriculum is diversity of thought, diversity of voices, um, no risk it, no biscuit, the Aryans <laughs> uh, phrase, you know, just kind of using how they approach a winning football team and creating a winning football team and use that in the classroom in really healthy ways. Um, so we went into the classroom with them, uh, which is a lot of fun. They were kind of having a parade like the Bucks had had the victory parade. You know, they didn't throw the trophy across the water. <laughs> it was on land. It was a land-based parade. Um, but so there are really fun stories like that. That just happens to be one that somebody put on social. And so People have seen it, but I can guarantee you that that's happening, you know, with all these teams across the country with uh, women, young women, and also, by the way, young boys. We interviewed um, Kevin Stefanski, who's the head coach of the Browns, who said, you know, people think that I have hired a female chief of staff because I have a girl. It's not because I'm a girl dad. I'm also a boy dad. It's just because I wanted different voices. I thought she was the perfect person for this job. And when I interviewed her, it was a, from a suggestion of somebody at the Bills who had worked with her previously. 
we like it immediately hit it off and I knew that was it. Like she just had the right skills for the job. So I hired her. It didn't matter to me that she was a woman or where she had come from. I'm going to have to check out that school because I live right outside of Tampa now. I have to, oh, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So that's that's very exciting. I, yeah. That's certainly something I, I would love to uh, to see. Everyone's journey, Jane, is so different, right? You get to the NFL, everyone's got a different background. They all have a different story. But what similarities did you see in these women and their stories? Uh, well, the title actually of the series came from some of those similarities. It's called Earn In It because I kind of pre-interviewed and met with each of these women um, before th this idea really took flight. And every single one of them separately said, you know, I'm earning it, I'm earning it every day. Um, that is a thread that they, you know, they, they're happy to be role models and I think they're proud to be role models, but what they really don't want is the extra attention so much because they feel like they know more eyes are on them and they just want to get in. They love the game. They want to do their job really well. They know they've got this, uh, incredible position in the National Football League, and you have to earn it every single day. It's like a the same thing as a player, right? They know they have to keep their position, and you got to work at it. Um, so that is one thing I will say is a thread through all of them. They also are just like, you know, as I say, I, uh, NFL players are a different DNA, wildly competitive, passionate about the game. The drive is like nothing you have ever seen before. I don't have to tell you that. It's same with coaches. Same with these women. They just have a different drive. Um, and that is what propels them to do this. Like, can you imagine being the first in this male dominated world where like it's arguably the most male dominated, you know, industry that takes a lot of guts and, and certainly I would never be that brave. Um, so in order to do that, they really, I think, have to love it and have to have a different mindset. And they all kind of do is that they're unafraid to go in um, and just do their jobs. Well, they're certainly earning it. And like you said, e each and every day in talking to them and sharing their stories, what did you feel that they perceive maybe to be that biggest obstacle that they have to overcome? Yeah, the funniest is they don't use the word, like they don't use words like obstacle. <laughs> I always see things as like roadblock, obstacle, how am I gonna handle this? Um, they're very different. They actually, this is funny, but um, I told Roger this, that they remind me of Roger Goodell, like that he doesn't, he sees things, he wakes up optimistic morning and what is it, it's a challenge. How do we figure this out? What is the game plan? And that it was very similar with these women. I think the biggest issue was as of a few years ago, there was no way for them to get in the league. So the creation of a pipeline that there's a way that a really smart, talented football woman um, can get an opportunity to meet and maybe meet a Ron Rivera who might take a chance on her or a Kevin Stefanski or Sean McDermott or whoever it may be. Um, the fact that that pipeline has been created, uh, I think that probably was the biggest, you know, obstacle challenge, whatever. And now that that's there and it's getting more robust, um, I, I think this, we're going to see this pace of change continue probably. How much does it help? How significant is it when someone like a Bruce Arians, who is he's so well respected, he's a longtime coach. He's also like an old school coach, but he makes yeah. it a point, right, to hire women on his staff. And I saw in the trailer, he emphasizes that door needed to be broken. How much does that help? I, I, don't, I think it's huge. Again, it's like the women themselves. You can't even quantify the impact that that has. You know, it's interesting. Ron Rivera talks about how he stood up in an owner's meeting, uh, you know, no media, just head coaches in the room and said, hey, guys, you should give this a try. And if anyone has any questions about hiring women, um, talk to me. Cause he, and he said it was like, people were a little bit sheepish about it. Like, I'm kind of interested in that, but what did your guys say? How, what was the reaction in the locker room? That kind of stuff. Um, I think, you know, Sam Rappaport is the woman at the league who is a former professional tackle quarterback. And she is the one who created this pipeline, which is, you know, what they now call the NFL women's forum, which is they kind of match people up and allow these women to, to meet people like the Ron Rivera's. She said, I couldn't have done it without Ron. Uh, because he really was the first to raise his hand and say, let's try it and let's be honest about it. Of course, there's going to be hesitation if you've never had a woman assistant coach before. Um, but let's see how it works. And he's a big believer in diversity. So um, 
I think the those guys, the those guys I named, those head coaches, like that is the impact of that is just huge. We see the women making the great strides, as you mentioned, and they're getting these opportunities, some in front office roles and several as assistant coaches. How realistic though do you think it is, Jane, that we'll we'll see a GM, a female GM, or a female head coach in the near future? Yeah, we asked um basically everybody that, uh, including all the head coaches. Um, and I think the general agreement is that it is going to happen. Um, I think the important thing that everybody seemed to point out was that it has to happen, you know, organically and it has to be a good fit, right? It's going to happen. That job opening is going to have that right candidate who happens to be a woman and hopefully it works. Um, you know, the one big thing to point out in all of this is like nobody's Pollyanna-ish about it. You know, it's like anything else. As we've seen the last couple of weeks, teams separate from their head coaches and GMs and coordinators and all that kind of stuff. That's going to happen. Um, and, you know, it, there'll be more eyes on it because the first time it happens with a woman, right? There'll be a lot of questions and that kind of stuff. But um, I, I do think it's it's in the probably near future. I would never venture a guess as to when, but everybody, including the women, want it to happen in the right way. So mm -hmm. it's the right person at the right time. Well, that makes sense for sure. I want to ask you this, as a former journalist, there is ample, obviously, coverage of the NFL. It is the <laughs> dominant sport. How do you feel about the overall coverage? Um, that is such a loaded question, Rob. So... <laughs> <laughs> we can go in so many different areas with it. I have some opinions, but I'm not going to share them right now. Maybe that's better over a cocktail. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would say, you know, like any topic today, politics, COVID, whatever we're talking about, you know, there's obviously still, I went to journalism school, there's still great reporters and great reporting out there. There's some maybe that doesn't fall into that category. Um, uh, so, you know, I would say the most interesting story that I have read just last week was about the, it was actually about the Nielsen ratings, which said that, which this, I had to read the story three times because I'm like, this can't be true. It's true. Out of the top hundred shows of last year on television of 2021, 75 of them were NFL games. Like that is bonkers. Uh, and if you think about creating a product or a series or content or whatever and that's the audience you're going to get that's pretty crazy so to me it just kind of says the fans speak uh have spoken there and they seem to be satisfied with that product um so i don't know that kind of answers your question it doesn't answer your question but no, we'll have a cocktail I, I, I'm, I'm there I'm, I'm ready for it but i probably all 75 of those i was there i was watching every single if yeah. not i was at the game you mentioned yeah. soldier field right earlier and watching it when did you develop your love for football do you yeah. have that earliest memory of going to a game or, or oh yeah what was it yeah, so um, we, my family, I grew up in Chicago, and my family has had Bears tickets since 1972, season tickets, and so um, my father kind of famously, when Roger asked him if we could, he could marry me, he said, oh, you're so lucky, I prepared her so well for this life. <laughs> no, this was before he was the commissioner, but, you know, he's worked there since he was 23, so he was, you know, in some other role um, in the league, and um, so we, I, we started going when I was little like and i laugh now to we have daughters and i laugh now when we go to games because i say guys look around and you don't think twice the stadium is filled with women of all ages but at the time in the 70s there were not a lot of little girls in <laughs> at soldier field um i went with my older brothers and my dad um and it was uh it was just part of our life and uh, it still is to this day everybody we're all on this group text and actually my mom is probably the biggest fan and i think about it now and i feel a little bad because there was a, there were four tickets and i think she probably always gave that one to me when she would have liked to have gone which only a mom would do again but um so it's really just was ingrained in us and you know the 70s for the bears and cold soldier field those were some tough years so you know I learned to get used to ups and downs. Let's say well, that. So. One day I'll have to share my story of, see, I grew up in Philly at Old oh. Government Stadium, sitting in yes. a 700 level. And there were some experiences there that led me to not wanting to take children 
Yeah, too, I bet. but that that's different. <laughs> We're now in Tampa. The girls do want to go see the Bucks at some point if I can actually not work a game. So yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll save those stories for another time. All right. Well, they can come with me next time I'm in Tampa. I'd love to take your girls. Uh, I love sitting with girls at games. That that's awesome. So last year we hit the pandemic hits, the world shuts down, but the NFL continues. And so many of us needed the NFL to do what they were doing to give us some semblance of normalcy. And then the draft happens and there's Roger <laughs> in the basement announcing the picks and, and like all the eyes of the world are, are on him because there's nothing else going on in sports, but the NFL draft. Yeah. So I was wondering, Jane, like, where are you when he's, yeah, I can imagine there's not a lot of people because of COVID, how the right. setup was like. So yeah. are you are you upstairs? Are you running down, giving him any tips during commercials? Because <laughs> you're a pro. Uh, what was that like? No, you know, he felt so strongly about making that happen. I mean, if you kind of take yourself back, it, it feel, all feels like a dream kind of mm -hmm. April of 2020. But um, if you take yourself back, like there, it was a very grim time. And they were trying to do something. I said, I used to work in news and I was like, that was like election night on steroids when we thought it was big, when we had, you know, like 20 cameras somewhere, or remotes coming in. I mean, they had 200 plus like remote cameras coming in. People, you know, players and their families had to set up these kits in their houses. And is that even going to work technologically and all that kind of stuff? So um, I did not get involved. He, he very much wanted to make it happen. And he just he was like, if it isn't perfect, it doesn't matter. It's just something for people to like hold on to. And we're going to show the world that you can, life can keep going and, and see how it goes. So he was just kind of funny in his like little element with like the jacket and then the jacket came off. And then people are like, he looks like he's drunk or he's sleeping with a t-shirt. <laughs> he was not, by the way, either of those things. But um, he was just so enjoying the experience. I mean, the draft is by far like his favorite event of the year because he loves the like young guys and I guess people picking him up or hugging him whatever he loves to see their he stands the in there strongly when he gets there yes. he gets, you know sometimes some guys are doing chest bumps and no. you got to give him credit he's not getting knocked down so. it's crazy uh, but he loves it because he, he feels like it's like you know such a fresh start and it's hope for their fa you know those dreams come true it's hope for all the fans who the season starts, everybody's equal, right? Um, but actually the funniest is I was in, uh, looking for something on my phone the other day and I found <laughs> the outtake. So, so it's COVID and our kids are home. And so we sit down to the dinner table one night in March and he said, um, here's the thing. And he was kind of perplexed and he said, Jerry, Judy, uh, a draftee, um, what says because we can't hog when he gets drafted, he'd like me to do a TikTok dance with him. <laughs> and we were all like, what do you say? Like, go dad. So um, we waited and he said, I think I'm going to do it. And so I have these outtakes of our daughters who were teenagers <laughs> um, to coaching him and be like, no, no, it's like left, not right, left. Don't you, that's the song. So <laughs> it's very funny. And I'm like, those are kind of gold. I could probably sell those outtakes to somebody, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I'm going to have, you're going to have to text those over or something. <laughs> I, I don't trust you with them. No way. I, pro I promise they would not go on AP 15 million <laughs> Twitter feed. I promise. <laughs> someday, someday, maybe. I don't know. We'll, well see. They're we very funny though. Outside of our, our love for football, we have something in, in common. We, we have twin daughters. My wife and I have eight-year-olds. Oh. Uh, my favorite part about it is they're, they're inseparable, and it's only been eight years, but they're best friends. They're always together, and, and to me, it's just beautiful. They're never alone. They're never bored. What, what do you yeah. love most about having twins? Oh, you're so lucky. Plus eight is like the sweet spot, right? Um, they still love you, daddy. Yes, yes. <laughs> daddy daughter dates and hugs yeah. and cuddles. It's, it, I'm going to milk that for as long as I can. Yeah. Oh, it's so fun. Um, yeah, I would definitely say watching, you know, I never had sisters, so I never thought that I ever wanted a sister until I watched those two together. Now I'm like, Ooh, that would be fun. Um, we have the, have had this funny experience that we, um, you know, Roger would be working a lot on the weekends and he didn't want to miss out on that. That's the best time with your kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we, when they were about five or six started taking them to games, all over. So we'd be in, you know, mm -hmm. Minnesota or Buffalo or Cleveland or whatever for the weekend, spending a lot of time at football games and often at stadiums like 
two or three hours before game time and you're little and you're like, what would you do? But the fact that they had each other, yeah, um, yeah. you know, they entertain each other. So it, that, I always say that's a little kind of a little bit like the dirty, dirty little secret of twins is my friends would complain about toddler age and keeping them entertained and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, and I'd be looking at them like playing with each other. They don't, you know, they didn't need as much because they're yeah. such a funny little unit. So you're very, very lucky. Yeah, I always say, people say double trouble. We always go, no, double blessing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Double, double blessing. Well, yours obviously got into football much sooner than mine did. They <laughs> On this New Year's Day, about whenever it was, two weeks ago, uh, we went to the beach here in, in Florida and we played football on the beach. And now all of a sudden they both decided they want to be quarterbacks like Tom Brady. So what advice would you have for them? And this docu-series, you know, I'm going to sit them down and have them watch it because they can have any one of, of these roles and maybe even be a quarterback like Tom Brady. Well, if you're going to have two quarterbacks in your house, Rob, <laughs> watch out, right? <laughs> so I don't know if they're competing for the same role or competing against each other. Um, I actually wish my daughters were on with us because they probably would have better advice than I have. But um, I would just say that we have, I say to Roger all the time, you are the luckiest, like, girl dad in the world because they both are just massive fans not not just passionate fans but like they love the stats and they play fantasy have for oh. years and um they love it like they will sit uh they're um you know older now but they will so they're not at home but they will sit on a sunday if he's home and they'll all just be on a facetime watching an entire game together <laughs> so um as if they're with them in the room so um the, I think the thing is just sharing your love of it with them. So Roger never made it about w work so much for him. If he had a bad day at the office, he's just not the kind of person who comes home and complains about it. He lo he loves his job so much. He doesn't really complain, but um, he just always shared and I love it too. So like they got from us how much we love the game. We love, I mean, the opportunity to be able to go to a stadium and see a game in person is like, I, it, you know, you still get, you know that, like I, you yeah. still get chills, I think, mm -hmm. um, being able to see what happens on that field and the, what those athletes can do. It's incredible. So um, I think it's like, a, you know, that they learn that, they feel that, and they kind of got our passion for it. So um, we made it, I think we tried anyway to make it fun. Um, and, you know, they still each pick a game each season that they would like to go to and we all go, the four of us. So we were like a little traveling band. That's uh, very, that's very yeah, cool. Excellent very, advice. Very fun. Well, Jane, thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure. I really appreciated your time. Looking forward to oh, the docu you. series. I, I think it's uh, very much needed and it's a tremendous work out of all of the women in the NFL. Thank you. Well, the coolest thing is we're working this week on uh, part of the last couple episodes are going to feature a woman actually produces the Super Bowl halftime show. Mm. Um, so which I have just gotten to know her a little bit. So Mary J. Blige is going to be the only woman on the stage with a bunch of guys, too. So we're interviewing Mary J. Blige and the woman who produces halftime. We're going to get some cool kind of behind the scenes um, uh, see, uh, all access to that. So that should be a lot of fun, too, and something very different than um, what people have seen before. So 